On this edition of Kilts and Culture with USA Kilts, Lucas Mitch, our bagpipe guru and resonant instructor, stops by. Welcome to USA Kilts Live. We are uh, uh, live. <laughs> <laughs> so this week, <clears throat> we have Lucas, who is the uh, store manager in the uh, in the studio here. He's also our bagpipe guru yes, and our, our expert, as it will. Um, we also have Adam, uh, who's a new employee. He's on the... Uh, uh, microphone, yep. turntable, he's scratching and whatever. Uh, <laughs> scratching and mixing. Throwing out some jams, were. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Jamming out. Um, and since uh, Lucas er, Lucas is filling in for Eric this week, basically Eric's off on vacation. So Mac is actually over there uh, going to be asking the questions. If you guys have any questions and you want to uh, uh, put them on the comment section below and we'll get to them as soon as we can. Yeah. Uh, Mac's going to be reading those and Otherwise, it's me and Lucas here. Yeah, we've got a lot of questions, so we'll see how many we can get through. Um, if we don't get to your question, let us know so we can include it for a future broadcast so we don't miss out. We had a lot of questions last time. I think we got to most of them. There were a couple that came yeah. in at the end we didn't go into full detail on, but if you have any more that come up along the way, make sure you let us know so we can include those for the yep. next one, just in case we don't get to it. It's nothing personal. Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. start it off, Lucas. Um, well, we're starting with a bagpipe question uh, from Logan. And Logan says he has an older set of pipes, a lamb bag. By lamb bag, he means a sheepskin bag. Uh, he's saying the bag is stiff, it's brittle, the pipes no longer play. He was given them uh, many years ago. They sat for a lot of the time. He's asking how much does it cost to have the bag replaced and the pipes checked over. Well, for those of you that are not bagpipers, uh, sheepskin was used for a long, long time for pipe bags. It is still used, but it requires a lot of maintenance. So for guys that are not playing every single day, uh, that's something that you probably don't want to get into. You've got a couple different types of pipe bags. You've got synthetic bags. You've got synthetic hybrid bags, you have leather bags, and then you have the sheepskin bags. So unfortunately, uh, Logan, you're probably going to have to replace it. Uh, sheepskin requires a lot of maintenance to keep the moisture taken care of, and over time, it gets to that point where it's brittle, and it definitely has to be replaced. So, Just like any old leather jacket yeah, or something like exactly, that. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. So for, for replacing it, you probably want to look into getting a synthetic bag or a synthetic hybrid bag. Now, the synthetic hybrid bags, they have that synthetic Gore-Tex in them. It's a mix of that. They also have uh, a stronger kind of synthetic substance in them as well, so it feels closer to what a leather bag feels like, and that's really optimal uh, for playing. Leather bags require a little bit more maintenance, uh, but they're really not so bad compared to a sheepskin bag when you're playing one of those. So in looking at cost, um, having that bag replaced, uh, synthetic bags are usually going to be around 200 bucks. Um, if you're able to switch out all the sticks and stocks on the pipes and change it yourself, um, usually that takes anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, there's some guys out there who can probably do it faster, um, but that's something that I can do for you if you're bringing them into the shop. Um, it sounds like you need to do an overhaul, take a look at everything. Um, for those of you that are musicians, um, you know that keeping your instruments up to snuff, keeping everything maintained is really important. With bagpipes, that's absolutely the case because there's so many little bits and pieces that you have to check for air tightness, make sure uh, the drones, when you're tuning them, uh, that that is a comfortable fit. So learning to play the bagpipes, which we'll probably talk about later, we have a couple questions on here for that. Um, part of that is learning how to maintain the instrument as well. So in short, <laughs> to answer your question, uh, you're gonna spend anywhere probably from two to 400 bucks to get everything back up and running. Um, obviously, taking all of that into consideration. That leather bag, it's seen the end of its life, so those you really can't hold on to, uh, you really need to get that off and get a new one on to make sure that everything is gonna be airtight so you're not struggling with the instrument. That's always something that's difficult is uh, somebody who has an older set of pipes and maybe they're new, you know, they got them from their grandpa, they got them from their dad or somebody in the pipe band, and unfortunately they're struggling with something and they don't really know what it is. So it's really helpful to have someone like me, or if you're in a local band, you can have somebody in the band take a look at it for you and get you going so you're not struggling without, ne without need <laughs> as you're going along. Yeah. Mac, we got a question from the audience. Yeah, Lucas, can you uh, just go over that bag you said about changing out the bag? What sure. type of bag was that again? Sure, that was a hybrid synthetic bag. So there's straight synthetic bags, which are lighter material, and then the hybrid bags are a little bit thicker. Um, so that, like I said, gives you more of a feel 
of a uh, leather bag. So it's a little bit thicker. I think it's a little bit more comfortable to play. You'll find uh, folks playing with just straight synthetic bags. They feel really light. Some folks like them, so if that works, great. The hybrid bags are a little bit thicker, so that makes it more comfortable to play. It feels like you have a better weight balance between the weight of the drones and the bag itself. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. Cool. Um, next question we have on the list here is from Charles. And Charles is saying uh, he has seen references to great kilts and ancient kilts. He's asking the differences between the two. The, uh, the ancient kilt is, uh, is, is very, quite ancient. It, it, it goes all the way back to about um, 1995 in the movie Braveheart. <laughs> um, basically, ancient kilts, uh, to cut to the short of it, the ancient kilts are not, they're kind of just made up. Um, it basically made up for the movie Braveheart. What he means by an ancient kilt is a half piece of fabric, so only about uh, 30 inches wide or 20, 27 to 30 inches wide, and then he's gonna it'll be at roughly six, seven yards long. And basically you would pleat it up like you would a great, a great kilt, where you would actually hand pleat it on the ground, that kind of thing, and roll yourself into it, and then instead of having a big upper section that is going to be above the top of the belt, above the fold, that you gather around your waist and up over the shoulder and kind of brooch it at the shoulder. Um, an ancient kilt kind of is a, a mock one of those where they just take one of the aprons, the under apron or the over apron, and they make it a good two and a half yards longer than it normally would be. And then they just pull that straight up and over the shoulder and down the back. Um, an ancient kilt is not ancient. It's just something that was made up about 20 years ago or so, just effectively for the movie Braveheart in Hollywood. Um, there are some vendors who sell ancient kilts on their website. Um, if you want to do that, all you need to do is just buy a, a length of cloth, single width, and then wrap it around you, similar to the way you would a great kilt. Gotcha. Cool. Mac. Uh, just a follow-up to that, Luke, uh, er, er, oh, geez, I'm not gonna get through all the names here. Rocky, <laughs> the... Uh, we have one uh, one gentleman here is asking when our outfit that we currently have, like similar to the mannequin in the back. When did that, when did that start? When's the origin of that? When did that be kind of begin? Yeah, kind of yeah. like the mannequin behind you. Um, I, I don't want to say because I don't want to get the date wrong. <laughs> uh, Eric is more the historian than me. Um, it occurred, uh, basically in English in, in, by. In English, the, the, the story of it goes, and again, don't quote me on this because I'm not 100% sure I'm correct, but the story on it goes was basically they were working in factories and they had to cut it in half lengthwise so that they would have their upper, board, upper body free to be able to move around and not get caught in machinery. So I believe the Englishman's name was Parkinson or something like that mm -hmm. um, who actually designed it. Um, and it kind of evolved over time. I don't know if it was a firm date of, you know, on July 18th, you know, 1803 is when it actually came to be. Um, it just kind of evolved. Uh, one of the things that I noticed recently when we were looking at uh, pictures of old kilts, yeah. historical pictures, is I was looking at the pleating on the back of the kilts, and I literally said to the kilt makers, my God, this is horrible. Yeah. Like, there was no pattern, and just my my OCD-ness, <laughs> my... my <laughs> My, my persnickety-ness, shall we say, <laughs> um, to have to pleat to the exact set and have you know, lines within a, right. an eighth of an inch and that kind of thing. Right. I was looking at this old kilt, just looking at it going, <laughs> how could, did the tailor take pride in this? Yeah. But it's just how it was done back then. So it kind of evolved over time to our level of you know, anal retentiveness that we're at now mm -hmm. versus what was done several hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Um, there's another question here from Sean. We've talked about this a couple times. Um, Sean is asking, have you designed any tartans for customers? I assume he means you, Rocky. <laughs> um, yes, a couple hundred. Yep. <laughs> the, quite, uh, quite a few. <clears throat> we actually just launched our tartan designer on our website. Um, I don't think it's official yet, uh, but okay. I'll say it now if you want to poke around at it. Cool. If you go to usakilts.com forward slash tartan designer, um, you can actually design your own tartans. And it's a, a neat little tool, doesn't cost anything, you do whatever you want with it. We just made it for our customers to be able to use. Mm -hmm. um, we've used tartan design programs like that for a long time. Um, uh, several customers have come and asked us to design tartans. Um, the Fogarty, I believe, is one of the ones. Yes. It's a name, an Irish name. Mm -hmm. um, 
there's we've done several named tartans. We've done tartans for organizations. Mm -hmm. We've designed multiple tartans for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, the American Heritage Tartan, which is actually behind me on this mannequin, um, was one of the first ones we designed. Kelly designed the firefighter memorial. I designed the law enforcement. So we've had experience designing, you know, hundreds or a couple hundred tartans over 15 years or whatever mm -hmm. in business. Um, yes, if you want a tartan designed for you, absolutely, we can help. Drop us an email, sales at usakilts.com, and we'll just, you know, talk out the details, what you're looking for, um, and yeah, we can happily help you. Definitely check out the tartan designer. It's really cool. I think designing new tartans is really neat. There's definitely a parallel with designing new tartans and continuing that tradition, as well as folks that are writing new music, whether they're writing new bagpipe music or more, you know, more Celtic music. They're taking old arrangements, putting it together, but furthering the tradition in those ways with a, with a personal spin is is really neat. So anytime we have the chance to participate in that, it's, it's really a great opportunity. We enjoy that Absolutely. a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, next question uh, is from Steven, and he's saying he would like to have a kilt pleated to the stripe but he is not sure how to determine what tartans will look good to the stripe. He's asking, is there a way to determine that easily? <clears throat> yes. Uh, the easiest way to determine whether a kilt is gonna look good pleated to the stripe or pleated to the set is what I used to, or what I still call, the Christmas tree test. Um, it's the same test you use for when you're decorating your Christmas tree to see where you're missing lights. Basically, squint your eyes at a tartan. So the tartan behind me is the American Heritage. It has that bold white stripe in it. If you squint your eyes at that tartan, that white stripe kind of pops and you know jumps off the tartan at you. Versus if you're looking at a tartan and nothing is kind of coming out, it all just kind of blends together. In that instance, I would say pleat it to the set. If you squint and an individual stripe kind of jumps out at you, then pleat it to the stripe. Or you can pleat it to the stripe. What I will say is, Every tartan looks good pleated to the set. Not every tartan looks good pleated to the stripe. Um, if, you're, if you're not sure what we're actually talking about right now, pleating it to the stripe means down the center of every single pleat going down the back of the kilt, vertically down every single pleat, will be a individual stripe that is on each pleat. If you pleat a kilt to the set, what it means is the pleats going across the back look like the pattern. So you'll have, you know, a particular stripe down this one. The next pleat, you'll have a different stripe or, a, or a, just a regular blank section. Um, and it kind of, as you stack the pleats up, it builds back up into the pattern. Whereas the stripe, the front of the kilt and the back of the kilt look different where there's a stripe running down the center of every pleat. Yeah. And on the drop-down options for our eight-yard wool kilts, folks actually have the option to pick set, stripe, or hey, let the kilt makers decide. And we use that pretty frequently, um, especially if we're helping folks out in the store, we'll even use that option because we don't have the kilt maker brain of being able to look at that piece of cloth with every one and say, okay, which is gonna look better pleated to the setter stripe. So it's always nice to know that that's there so you don't have to cause turmoil <laughs> determining which way to go. Yep. Yeah. All right, um, let's see here. Uh, Sean, another question from Sean. Thank you, Sean. He's asking, he wants to get a tweed jacket and accessories, uh, like a vest, a tie, new hose, flashes, sporin. <clears throat> Sounds like a package. <laughs> Do we offer design services for a kilt someone already owns? What day of the week and what time of day is it best to show up unannounced? Um, I always say call first just to make sure there's nothing weird going on mm -hmm. um, and just to make sure the store is going to have normal hours. Mm -hmm. um, normal hours being Monday to Saturday, 10 to 6. Yep. Now, yes, Happily, um, we do that for, you know, kind of as a de facto thing for the majority of our customers. Just come into the store, bring your kilt. We can lay out the tweed swatches that we actually have here in-house right on the kilt just to figure out which one works best with it. Mm -hmm. You can bring out the sporn that you're looking at, you know, the kilt pins. We can basically create the outfit for you right in the store. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of what we do is we try to be, uh, basically help the customers and we understand what it means to just, you know, have this huge daunting task of, uh, I want to wear a kilt, but I have no idea what I'm doing. We all started there. We all had to start somewhere. So we know that, we understand that, and we're very cognizant of that. Yeah. So when you come into the shop, it's not, it's not something we don't do for everybody else. Just come in, bring what you have, be a sponge, 
we'll give you all the information uh, that you're going to need. We're going to make sure you look good because ultimately you're a representation of us out in the world. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that you look good so that when people ask you, where'd you get your kilt? You tell them you got it at us or with us. And one quick thing I'll mention just as far as the timing goes, Saturdays we have a lot of customers who we would say are destination shoppers. They're coming from a really far uh, way away from New England, folks from down south. Uh, that's great, and we really appreciate the time that you take to come in and visit us in person. And it's always worthwhile to take a look at everything in person. So if you come in on a Saturday, don't be surprised if things are really, really busy. Um, that's when things usually get moving pretty fast out there in the store. But as you said, Rocky, just having folks call ahead is always a good thing just to check. Yeah, and yeah. our slow, just uh, to actually answer your question, our slower days are usually Wednesday mm -hmm. or Thursday. Yeah, or Tuesday Mid middle Wednesday. of the week. Yeah. yeah, middle of the week kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and middle of the day is fine. Mm -hmm. You don't want to come in too close to close because you want to make sure that we have time to get to all your questions and whatnot. Right. Um, but yeah, come on in. We're happy to help. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Mack. All right, Lucas, this is geared a little bit towards you. You got on, it. Um, on channel reads. Uh-huh. Um, do you, should pipe bands, um, do they all, do they all have this, use the same channel reads? Should everyone have individual different ones? Mm -hmm. uh, how does that all sure. work? Sure. When it comes to chanters and pipe chanters with pipe bands, uh, you're going to see a lot of uniformity at high levels of playing. So everybody playing the same chanter, everybody playing the same chanter read is going to be pretty prevalent when you're looking at that. Um, that's making sure that all the variables that people are experiencing are as close as possible so you don't have crazy different things going on if somebody has a different chanter or a different read. You're keeping everything as uniform as possible so that all those variables are controlled to make it easier to get everyone in tune. Now that being said, you're gonna have players who maybe they're not playing a, 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 a medium or a hard read, they're playing an easy read because that's what they're used to. So the strength of the read may vary, but the type of read and the chanter, uh, they're typically going to be uniform and that's always ideal. Uh, to keep those variables minimal, to take as much uh, as, as as much care in tuning as possible. Yep. Cool. Next. Next, uh, we have another piping question from William, and William is asking, "What steps should I take to learn the bagpipes?" Um, and then there's another tartan question here, so I'll, I'll answer uh, the bagpipe question first. Uh, William, you've got to go to Edinburgh, go up to the top of Arthur's seat and talk to a piping guru that's there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you're going to start with a practice chanter uh, and a tutor book. So the practice chanter is the preliminary instrument before you get to the full set of Highland bagpipes. And uh, we have those on the website. Those are pretty easy um, to get started on. And financially, you're paying under 100 bucks really to get started for the practice chanter and the tutor book. Uh, you're definitely gonna wanna have an instructor of some kind if there's nobody local for you. There's definitely online options for instruction. You definitely wanna have somebody giving you pointers and tips along the way. And really, the best thing you can do for yourself is immersing yourself into bagpipe music, listening to high-level bands, turn on YouTube, listen to some of the World Pipe Band Championships, get inspired, uh, start listening to solo players, so you can just immerse yourself in all of that information and start to train your ear as you're learning the, the embellishments and learning the tunes. So if you have any questions on that, you can feel free to shoot me an email. It's just lucas at usakilts.com, and I'd be happy to help you out with that. There's a lot to learn with piping, uh, but once you get over the hurdle of learning all the basic embellishments, learning the tunes, and getting up and playing, uh, it's a great community to be a part of. And even as you're learning, you're going to meet a lot of great people along the way from all walks of life uh, who just share this common interest and love of a, of a really fantastic instrument. And you have the, the rock star fame fortune status absolutely that you achieve absolutely as soon as you get to your pipes yeah it's, yeah you just rocks every every person mm -hmm. wants to know you you know get your autograph it's, yeah it's it's really uh it's unsettling yeah <laughs> cool um and uh william was also asking what do we do to produce a rare tartan kilt and how are they priced um a rare tartan kilt as in you think he means custom weave, um, or just one that's? I would I would estimate custom weave. Okay, so read here. the question again to me. Yeah, he says, "What do you do to produce a rare tartan kilt, and how do we price them?" Okay, um, assuming or under the assumption, working under the assumption, you're talking about a custom woven uh, kilt. 
<clears throat> yes, we do them. Um, it's either as part of our design service or just you say, hey, I want this particular tartan and none of the mills weave it. Um, come to us with the tartan that you're looking for and we wanna make sure that it is not a uh, restricted tartan, it's not copyrighted, anything like that. Um, assuming it's not copyrighted, you tell us the color palette that you're looking for, whether it's ancient, weathered, modern, or muted, um, or if you're trying to match the, the tartan registry's colors as close as you can. Um, then we go to the mill, we say, okay, I wanna order, you know, if you're ordering, uh, and, well, we basically the, the, the mill that we use for custom weaves has 10 meters, they, they weave in specific lengths. Mm -hmm. So 10 meters is what they make us purchase. So we weave 10 meters of cloth, and then we make either a five yard or an eight yard kilt from that and either hand you the rest of the cloth and say, here you go, um, or we can make stuff from the rest of the cloth for you. Um, pricing for a uh, basically 10, the way we just, we just structured it differently on the website where it's 10 yards of cloth, which includes the makeup for a five yard wool kilt. If you say you want to upgrade to a, uh, 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 an eight yard wool kilt mm -hmm. that'll add some money on uh, the five yard wool kilt and cloth being about 900 bucks. And then if you want to make it into an eight yard kilt, that's going to be like a thousand fifty and it goes up from there mm -hmm. and you can add a few things on. It's, it also depends on economy of scale. If you're looking for just one kilt or multiple kilts, right. um, yeah, it's kind of a roundabout way. It's a very convoluted process to a degree, but we can do it. We've done it a million times. Not a problem. Yeah. Mr. Mac. All right, so we got a question about military tartans. Okay. Um, as far as the availability of certain branches, uh, and one being uh, the CB tartan uh, in particular, mm. um, can we get those? Do we have them? How do they? Is there certain restrictions against the, some of those tartans? <coughs> How does it all work? Sure. Um, military tartans. There, there are military tartans. I don't believe any of them are official. However, there are several military tartans for the, the I'm, I'm assuming you mean the US military tartans. Um, so we have Army, AV, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard. Um, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines are all stock supported tartans from Strathmore Will & Company. There's also the Polaris tartan, I believe. There is the Seabees tartan. There's a few uh, tartans that are uh, uh, sections of a particular branch in the military, yeah. like the Seabees. Um, uh, and I actually designed one. Mac, do you remember what the name of the one was that I did? The uh, U.S. Civil Affairs Tartan. Oh, That's yeah. It. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's for it, and that one actually is official, mm -hmm. and for it to be official, we actually had to get, uh, I believe it was a colonel, in the uh, U.S. Civil Affairs Department to, to give his that. blessing on it kind yeah. of thing and say, yes, this is officially allowed to be done and registered as that. Um, all the rest of them have not been officially registered, uh, excuse me, have not been officially approved by the branch, um, but through wanton usage, they basically have become, you know, de facto military branch tartans. Yeah. The CBs um, does have a tartan. I believe that Strathmore weaves it in 11 ounce. Yes, we just ordered cloth for somebody that I didn't know until we ordered it that they actually stocked it and wove it as a as a as a standard tartan. So, yeah, yeah. Um, is I, th I want to say that there's one that we have to get uh, basically proven documentation that you are part of that branch. Is that, is that the Submariner? The is that the Submariner one? No, I don't think it's a Submariner one. Um, I thought it was Seabees, but maybe I'm wrong. We'll think of it in about an hour from there, now. There's, there's a first time for everything. I may <laughs> I may be wrong. There's a first time for everything. Um, but no, it's yes, we can get uh, most of the military tartans. The only one that's a little wonky is the uh, U.S. Coast Guard tartan. That one is effectively woven to order, and there's only one U.S. kilt maker who actually weaves it, and they actually uh, hand sew all the kilts for the for the Coast Guard pipe band. Yeah. Um, so that one's a little bit more difficult to obtain. However, all the rest of them, not a problem. Nice. Cool. Cool. Mr. Lucas. All right. Next question. Uh, Paul says he just ordered his first kilt. Thank you, Paul. Congratulations. And he's asking for any words of wisdom or guidance. Um, sure. Um, wear it like you wear a pair of shorts or a pair of khakis. Just wear it or a tuxedo. You know, effectively... The, the context is the king in this scenario. 
You want to make sure that, A, your pleats are in the back, but other than that, it's just how you're wearing it, the context, di the context dictates. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be wearing it to a festival, then wear it with a t-shirt, a pair of low socks, and a pair of sneakers. If you're going to wear it to a wedding, wear it with a Prince Charlie or an Argyle or a tweed jacket and a pair of kilt hose and flashes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. We'll look forward to seeing you in it. And if you're out and about, want to grab some photos and show us the kilt out in the wild, that's always fun, too. And that goes for everybody, too. Yeah. We love seeing pictures of you guys at fairs, doing the, the formal wedding photos, doing all sorts of things um, in your kilts. Always love to see that. Yeah. And yeah. if you have any questions or if you say, hey, I'm not sure if this pair of kilt hose in this color goes with my kilt or whatever, either just shoot us an email, stop by the shop, or yeah. give us a call. We're happy to help you out. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mack. Uh, this question is on kilt hose. On how high should the kilt hose be worn? Should the cuff, is there a certain distance the cuff should be as far as to the kneecap? Should the cuff be a certain length? Um, and also, uh, if, if you're a shorter person, you know, and you have a, a long, the kilt hose is a little bit longer. How do you hide the length of it? How do you get that length right? I'll leave that half to him. Um, I got it. The, the correct height for kilt hose is basically um, when you're wearing a kilt, you want to see a bit of knee. You do not want the kilt hose to go up to the top of the knee and the kilt to come down and meet them. You want to see knees. Um, so basically, the, the general rule of thumb is three fingers breadth below the bottom of the kneecap. So tuck your index finger up underneath the bottom of your kneecap and the top of your hose should be at the bottom of your ring finger. That's about the height that you want your kilt hose to be. I'm about 5'2", <laughs> so when it comes to kilt hose, ordering them from, uh, from Scotland, we, we have the medium colored kilt hose in stock. Those work really great uh, for folks of my stature. Uh, for folks who are looking for a smaller size, like if the foot on those colored kilt hose is, is a lot bigger, then we may want to order a pair of small Piper hose for you from Scotland because we can order the small size. And I want to say that's in the range of five to eight uh, for, for shoe size there, that's a great way to go. So when it comes to folding them over, uh, on the Piper hose especially, they give you plenty. I was just talking to somebody uh, in the store about this today. They give you lots lots and lots of room on the top. So you're gonna wanna do full, uh, two full turnovers to make sure that you've, you've brought it all the way down. Uh, don't be afraid to do that. It's okay if it, it's, if it sticks out a little bit, if it's a little bit thicker. Makes your calves look you know, nice and sturdy. So not a bad thing to do there. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. So yeah, when it comes to the foot size, um, on some medium size hose, depending on where they're coming from, the foot may stick out of the back of the shoe just a little bit. The heel. Um, yeah, the heel, yeah. So that's something, if it sticks out a little bit, uh, that's something, it's it's not going to bother me uh, personally, but if you want to try to get a better fit, I'd say the small Piper hose are probably the way to go. Those we can order for you in, in a number of different shades and colors. Or the yeah. cotton hose. Yeah, the cotton hose. The cotton hose, you actually fold down twice anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's a great way option. to go. They're, they're very comfy. I, I did a torture test on those when we were when we were looking to order them, and the worm around is very comfortable with, uh, with those, so that's another good way to go too. Oh. Absolutely. Mr. Lucas. Right on. Um, let's see here. Our friend Norman. Norman's saying that he recently bought a Tibetan brass bead pin, cool, uh, that he wants to use as a kilt pin. Is it okay to mix metals? Um, it's, it's personal preference. The Would I do it? No, probably not, but lots of people do. If you have a pin or a brooch, let's say your your grandmom died and you were very close to your grandmom and that pin, that brooch that she wore to church every Sunday really meant a lot to you, then Mazel Tov, well, I wouldn't say Mazel Tov for wearing to church, but <laughs> but <laughs> have at it. Uh, you know, wear, you can wear that brooch as a kilt pin. A lot of people uh, wear creative things as a kilt pin because frankly, it's just a bit of jewelry that goes on the front of the kilt. Yeah. So traditionally, using my finger quotation marks, a kilt pin is a sword shape with a bit of decoration or, you know, tall and skinny kind of uh, pin. However, there are people who would wear, you know, circular or a clan badge on there or different shapes or different sizes of kilt pins just because it means something to them. Mm -hmm. So if that Tibetan pin means something to you, even though it's brass, have at it. Yeah. 
Very cool. And and Eric, he, he always has some crazy kilt pins. He's taken some and modified them. And uh, yeah, you, you never know what kilt pin is going to be on Eric's kilt. So if he's back <laughs> in a little while uh, for the next broadcast, he could probably talk about that, show off some of the crazy ones he's made. <laughs> cool. Um, quick question from Troy. And Troy simply asks, proper way to wear a kilt? Daily. That's a solid answer. <laughs> exactly. The uh, now it's you can wear it. You know, there is no proper way. There's traditions. There's conventions. But there's no proper way, quote unquote, to do it. If you're gonna, you know, aside from pleats in the back, mm -hmm. make sure the pleats are in the back. Outside of that, it's context. So if again, if you're at the beach and you want to wear a kilt. Wear, you know, a t-shirt with it and a pair of, you know, slip-on surf shoes. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be at a festival, wear a pair of hiking boots and a uh, t-shirt or a uh, performance shirt. Yeah. If you're going to be outdoors all day. If you're going to be at a wedding, mm -hmm. a, you know, a tweed jacket and vest or a Prince Charlie. It really depends on context. Mm -hmm. So, these, the, the beautiful thing about kilts, frankly speaking, is the versatility. No other garment, I don't think so, no other garment <laughs> that a guy owns... Can you wear literally to the beach and to, you know, to festivals as well as full formal black tie affairs? Mm -hmm. A kilt is the only thing that I can think of that you can do that. It really is an extremely versatile garment. And the garment itself, the kilt itself, is only as formal or as casual as what you're pairing with it. And that's, that's something we talk about all the time in the store because somebody will come in and say, yep. hey, I'm getting a kilt for X event. I'm going to a wedding in Scotland. I'm going to this other formal event. They want to have it for that. And we'll talk to them. Hey, we want to make sure you get use out of this garment and you know that you can wear it to other things with a regular button-down shirt, with a T-shirt. So that's one of the things we love talking about and just seeing the oh yeah, I can wear it for all this other stuff and get a lot more use out of it than just that one formal event that they may be getting it for initially. Absolutely. Yeah. Mr. Mac. This one kind of ties into what you guys are already talking about. Okay. As far as now headwear, uh, bonnets, uh, Glengarry's, and Balmoral's and such, um, are they more of a strictly, strict, strictly a formal thing? Are they a semi-formal thing? When should they be worn? Um... No hat, aside from like a top hat, is really going to be formal. So it's wherever you would want to wear a hat. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be outside and it's hot, we, if you want to suffer for your art, so to speak, <laughs> and wear a black wool bonnet in the middle of August, mm -hmm. sun beating down on your head, yeah. have at it, but you're going to be hot. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to be wearing it in the middle of winter where you would normally wear a hat, then I'd say, sure, wear it then. Again, Context is key. Whatever you would normally wear with a pair of shorts or a pair of you know khakis or dress pants, whatever you're wearing with the rest of the outfit, you could wear the same type of headwear with a kilt um, or in the same scenarios that you'd be wearing a kilt. Yeah, I think we have a lot of folks who they're getting their full kit from head to toe and they're looking at... I'm like, oh my goodness, I've got all this cool stuff on every part of me except except for my head. My head feels naked. So you don't need to wear a Glengarry. A Glengarry is what most pipe bands wear now. That's the, the V-style cap. So you'll see that out with the bands. It's not something that you need. We definitely have folks who come in and want a Glengarry to wear to the Highland Games, especially if they're at a clan uh, tent. They're representing their, their clan. They'll want to get a Glengarry with the clan crest badge on it just for, just for something to wear to... Um, Tweed flat caps also look very cool with a kilt, approaching it from the totally casual direction. Guys look really sharp with those tweed flat caps on. If you guys can't can't see, Mac is wearing a tweed flat cap over there. So <laughs> that's always uh, always nice to have for, for the casual wear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. Mr. Lucas? All right, next one. Um, Arnon is asking, uh, he wants to wear his kilt this winter. He lives in upstate New York. Do you think that a semi-traditional kilt will be warm enough? Not to beat a dead horse. <laughs> Do I think a semi-traditional kilt will be warm enough to wear in upstate New York in the winter? Sure. It depends on what you wear with it. If you're going to be outside in the middle of winter shoveling snow, I'd suggest wearing a jacket and, you know, a, a snowboard jacket or a winter jacket and a hat. If you're going to be wearing it indoors, then it, a lot of guys uh, really concern themselves with 
is the kilt going to be warm enough or is it going to be too warm or whatever? Mm -hmm. And it really, again, depends on the context. If you're going to be indoors in the air conditioning, it's really not going to matter. If you're going to be outdoors in a field, sun beating down on you, yeah. you're going to be hot no matter what. Mm -hmm. So it's not really a matter, it shouldn't be a matter of, is this particular kilt going to be too warm or not warm enough? Um, if, period. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to think how else to, to phrase it. Yeah, I, it all depends on what you pair with it. If you're if you're wearing it out in the winter, um, definitely wearing some thick kilt hose with it to keep the uh, the lower portion of your body warm. That's important, and then wearing the jacket on the on the top. So that that goes a lot with with that is what you're actually pairing with it. What you're what you're yeah. actually doing. Yeah, your body temperature is more controlled by your what you're wearing on your head and what you're wearing on your torso. So if you're wearing a hat. It's going to trap the heat in a bit. If you're wearing a thick yeah. jacket, especially with layers, um, you're going to trap more heat in. If you're wearing gloves, it, you know your hands are going to stay warmer. So it really depends more on your upper torso and your head and how well they're covered and insulated versus not. Yeah. Sort of parallel question. Rocky used to snowboard. I don't know if you still snowboard or not. Did you ever wear a kilt when you were snowboarding? Um, I think no. no? The okay. uh, snowboarding came before my love of wearing kilts. Okay. Um, now I'm old and arthritic and crotchety, so I, <laughs> I, I don't go out and do them sports much as I used to, aside from uh, deck hockey I play. Okay. Yeah, but, I was just curious. I, now, that being said, yeah. we do have a USA Kilts hockey team, and I have threatened to make kilts for all the members of the team, uh, including our goaltender, because I figure, you know, it, you know, Jim can't stop any freaking shots. At least he can oh. wear a kilt across the, you know, cover the five hole with Ouch. It. Ouch. I don't think Jim is watching, but I will absolutely be sure to show him this video. <laughs> oh, Mac has another question for us. Uh, this is geared a little bit more towards you, Lucas, right. on uh, on bagpipe tunes. Oh. Um, I know I, I, we, I know there's bagpipes from different countries. You got it. And uh, I know you've played a few of them for us for mm -hmm. some of our videos. Mm -hmm. Are there any specific uh, Indian tunes, or are there for other countries? Is there certain tunes that are played? with those pipes? That's a really good question. So when you're looking at different tunes, um, what I'll say first is that on the Scottish bagpipes, the Great Highland bagpipes, you have a lot of, of room uh, to play different repertoire, to play different tunes. So you'll definitely have people who are taking traditional like European melodies uh, and playing them on the Highland pipes. So maybe, maybe it's a Welsh tune or an Irish tune or an English tune, something like that. And that's you know, that's understandable. Um, if you're stepping outside of the box, absolutely. Go find a tune from a different country and see if it works on the pipe. So with, with nine notes, you know, not every tune is going gonna, is gonna to work. So you may have to do a bit of experimentation with that. When you look at some of the other bagpipes from around the world, they have massive repertoires of, of music. So if you go to Galicia and look at those bagpipes uh, in Spain, there are so many tunes. I have a, I have a book that's like 300 pages of all these really wild, fun Galician tunes. So when you're looking at those other different types of pipes, usually it's going to be those um, traditional tunes that are being played on them from, from that region of the world. But as we talked about earlier, there's always people composing new things uh, for, for instruments. So you could very well have maybe not a full-on pipe band, but maybe a smaller ensemble with some sort of uh, European pipe or something like that involved in it uh, where they're grabbing tunes that, hey, this works really well for this instrument. So, you know, the piper's going to learn it or the piper learned this really cool tune from this section of the world. So everybody's going to learn it. So that's always really exciting to see how those tunes get, get traded around. Just how many, how many different pipes are there? Is there's, there... There's quite a few. I, I would say there are... There's there's a different type of bagpipe pretty much for every European country that's out there. Uh, some have more than one. The Scottish ones endured so long, the Great Highland bagpipes, because of the British Army when they were adopted um, and then traveling all over the world, and those pipes needed to be made from the military standpoint. That was a part of your field band, so you had to have people playing those, and thus you had to have people making them. So some of the other ones, which are not so popular, um, not so popular just because people aren't aware oh yeah you know Italy Spain France they all have these these really unique sets of pipes and that's a great YouTube rabbit hole if you want to jump right in start looking up you know bagpipes from around the world and you'll be amazed at the uh, at the talent and musicianship of some of these folks on obscure you know bagpipes that you've never seen before so lots of fun to check all those out and how many do you have 
not enough. <laughs> Got to collect them all. That's and then you get excited about seeing each one. You have to have each one, and yeah, you you quickly fill a house with bagpipes. So, gets crazy. <laughs> all right, next question here. Um, John is asking, can you wear the tartan of a different branch of your clan, or tartans of other clans? Tartan of a different branch of your clan, or tartan of other clans. So by that, he probably means um, maybe a different sept of a larger clan. So like, if you are, if you are McDonald, and I believe what you're asking is, mm -hmm. are you, if as a McDonald, are you allowed to wear a McDonald of Clan Ranald, um, or are you allowed to wear, you know, a completely different tartan McDougal or something? Um, uh, yes, within the bounds of good taste. The um, McDonald, using McDonald as the example. There's McDonald, and then there's McDonald at Clan Ranald, and a few other you know, different uh, McDonald's from specific regions in Scotland. Um, I don't, you are allowed to wear them. No one's going to stop you, um, but it is specifically for that branch of the family. Um, so just be aware that someone may say to you, hey, McDonald Clan Ranald, or is that what you are? And you just say, no, I'm just, you know, regular McDonald. I just really like this particular tartan. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way, if I'm wearing a, you know, Scott weathered tartan today, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and somebody says, oh, Scott, are you a Clan Scott? I say, no, I just really, really like this particular tartan, or I'm a kilt maker, and I love this tartan. It really spoke to me, and this is my wedding kilt, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So there's no... Hard rule, is someone, are the tartan police real? No. Is someone going to come up to you and throw you in jail because you're wearing a tartan from a different clan? No. Most people are just going to assume that the tartan that you're wearing is your clan. Yeah. Um, that being said, as long as you're wearing it respectfully, I'd say, you know, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. And um, he's asking... The, the other clans, I mean, we have folks come in all the time. The only other thing I'd add is, you know, maybe they don't really like their family tartan too much. They have, they have very limited options for their family, um, so they may end up getting a district or universal tartan or maybe a different clan tartan entirely. So that's very, uh, very common occurrence for us. Yeah. I'd also add, um, for instance, Buchanan. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Buchanan is a tartan that people either love or they hate, where Buchanan Modern, it's basically... A lot of yellow, a lot of red, and bottle green. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very bold colors. Mm -hmm. If you look at it in the ancient color palette, it's a lot softer. If you look at it in muted or weathered, in, in weathered specifically, it almost looks like an entirely different tartan just because of the yeah. color palette. Yeah. So if you're not a big fan, if you're a Buchanan, and you're not a big fan of the Buchanan modern, what I'd say is, have you seen the Buchanan weathered? Um, that one looks... Uh, a, it looks very different to the regular Buchanan, and a lot of guys who are kind of turned off, so to speak, by this particular tartan to modern Buchanan would, you know, kind of lean towards that. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Mac, you have a question for us. Yeah, we got a question on tweed kilts, and this actually comes from Scotland. Oh, um, cool. So, yeah, so we're, Hi, Scotland. We're reaching out. <laughs> so, um, they want to know what our thoughts are on tweed kilts, and what our thoughts on on uh, like pockets uh, that are would be would be added on not to like a utility kilt style but more just more of a contemporary style like the 21st with, century kilt yes kind of thing. something yeah. along those lines yeah. um tweed kilts are actually reasonably historically accurate as well they were worn way back then it was just a matter of that's the fabric that was you know local to that particular that weaver was weaving you know it's people want options yeah so Tweed kilts are fine. They're historically accurate, if you use my finger quotation marks. <laughs> <clears throat> um, the, uh, what was the rest of the question? It was asking along the lines of the, the, the cargo pockets. Oh, the cargo the, pockets the and whatnot. Things. Yeah. It's not, it's not our particular cup of tea. Um, see what I did there? Mm -hmm. They're from Scotland. Oh. You see what I did there? Uh, um, no, pockets aren't our particular cup of tea. So if you, if you want it, have at it. More power to you. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, I own a couple utility kilts. I haven't worn them for quite a while. But pockets on kilts are practical, and the kilt ultimately was a practical garment, yeah. you know, when it first started out. So there's nothing wrong with it. We're just sticking to more the tradi traditional tailored kind of kilt. Um, the one thing that I that I say about uh, tweed kilts often is 
to me, in my personal opinion, you have to be a little careful when you're wearing a tweed kilt. Um, I had a tweed uh, kilt suit. My first tweed kilt suit that I did for myself was charcoal gray kilt and charcoal gray jacket and vest. And it takes a certain personality to pull it off. Uh, when I was wearing it, I kind of felt like I was wearing a women's business suit. So I wasn't real comfortable wearing it. So you definitely have to accessorize it to the nth degree. You, map, you have to have on, in my opinion, kilt hose, sporin. You want to make sure people know you're wearing a kilt because they don't see the tartan and it just looks like there's something just a little bit off mm -hmm. when you're wearing a tweed, a full tweed kilt suit. Yeah. Now, that being said, your mileage may vary. You may like wearing tweed kilts and you, you know, you may be fine with it. That's fine for myself. I was just a little bit uncomfortable wearing it. I felt a little odd coming from a place where I normally wore traditional tartan kilts. Alrighty. Next question from James. Uh, James is asking how difficult and what is the cost to let out a kilt? It seems that the first kilt he bought uh, shrunk over the years. Ah, yes. They shrink in the closet. Horrible. I've Horrible had thing. that happen. Um, <laughs> especially when your wife cooks well. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the process to let a kilt out, it depends on how much weight you've gained. If you've gained two inches, all that has to be done is move the two straps and buckles on the right side of the kilt and the strap on the left side of the kilt that actually goes through the hole in the kilt. If you've gained five, six, seven inches, then it's effectively, if it can be done, um, if there's extra material built into the kilt, which sometimes kilt makers do, it's going to be a major reconstruction and going to cost a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so much so that for the most part, we just tell guys, look, sell the kilt on eBay, sell it on, you know, in one of the kilt groups on Facebook and go out and get a new kilt in your new size. It's much better to do that than try to effectively uh, pay for the labor to mm -hmm. tear a kilt apart entirely and then put, put it back, it together. back together. Yeah. yeah. Now there are the kilt extender straps as well, which work exceedingly well for a quick fix. And it's just a strap and buckle that fits over the existing strap and buckle on the kilt. So if you have gained a couple of inches, that's a really great way to go. We had a guy in the store uh, this week, a gent who drove up to see us and he was leaving for Scotland in about a week to go to a wedding. So luckily we just threw those kilt extender straps on his kilt and he was good to go. So no alteration time whatsoever and, and you're done, which is which yep. is always nice when uh, we can we can send you out the door with uh, with a completed completed alteration or just extended extender straps just like that. Yep, good point. Yeah, Mr. Mac. All right, Lucas, this mm -hmm. is for you. This is geared a little bit in your direction again. Okay. The let's say I'm I've mastered the Highland pipes. Okay. And I want to go on to another set of pipes, maybe like an Illin pipes. Yeah. How I'll do those skills? Do the skills transfer oh, over, or is there a little question. bit more? That's studying good, that I gotta That's do. a good question, yeah. Looking at the Highland Pipes, uh, if you have mastered the Highland Pipes, congratulations. <laughs> the uh, technique that you're that you're using, um, there's a little bit of crossover with playing Illin Pipes. Illin Pipes, there's, there's a couple different styles you can play, and you can play in an open style or a closed style. Um, a little bit of it translates. The dexterity in your fingers, the muscle memory, will help. Um, a lot of the times, if you're like, I, I played Highland Pipes for years and years, and then I picked up uh, the medieval pipes and uh, some of the some of the German bag pipes, which are really large. Uh, they have different uh, technique as far as the as far as the chanter work goes, but it was a relatively easy transition for me. So once you have the basics of the Highland Pipes, it's, it's a good start, but it really depends on that type of bagpipe that you're picking up. What I will say is that for Illin pipes, um, if you're playing Illin pipes, you'll see so many Illin pipers who also play the tin whistle. Maybe they're playing the, the high penny whistle in D or a low whistle. Uh, that is a, is a pretty uh, easier transition going back and forth. So those guys will play both. They'll play the Illin pipes and they'll play the whistles as well. So that's a much cleaner transition, I would say, with the technique that goes into one and, uh, and goes into playing the other. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Jared. Jared is asking us, is there such a thing as 16-ounce polyviscose? Maybe. It's kind of like Sasquatch. <laughs> um, the, uh, I thought that was uh, definitely yes. It's well. It's the the material that we get for our PV kilts, our, our lower end kilt models, all comes from one of the mills in the UK. They are the only mill, in in our humble opinion, that makes fabric that is good enough 
to make a PV kilt from. That's the only reason why we use it for the kilt. It makes a good, it's good enough to make a kilt from. Um, their cloth is 11 to 12 ounces. There are other companies that sell uh, wool or uh, polyviscose kilts, so they say they have a 16 ounce polyviscose fabric. Um, I've not, you know, done a chemical test or, you know, reverse engineered it and kind of tried to figure out if it is actual polyester rayon blend. Viscose is the effectively the fancy British word for rayon, effectively. Um, so I don't know if they're actually using polyester rayon blend in the kilt. The 16-ounce PV kilts that I've seen are a little stiffer and scratchier, for lack of a better term. Um, uh, not quite so far as like a burlap sack, but it's a li it's more that direction than a fine worsted wool. Mm -hmm. um, the so yes, there are companies out there that sell 16 ounce polyviscose. Um, I can't speak to the quality of the fabric or the quality of the finished kilt. We don't make anything out of that. Believe me, I've tried. I've looked for any of the mills that would weave 16 ounce or something heavier in PV cloth. But uh, in my years of searching, I have not been able to mm. find it. Gotcha. Sounds like a trip is uh, needed to the USA Kilts Laboratory to uh, develop <laughs> such a uh, such a technology. <laughs> mad scientist. You know? Yes. Yes. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Let, me, let me mess up my hair like a mad scientist. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> cool. Um, Tyler, is it, is it okay for someone without any family history to wear a kilt? He's mostly German. Italian and French. Uh, if so, is there a tartan that's best for him to wear? Um, sure. The German Heritage Tartan. It's one of the ones I designed. Um, <clears throat> this isn't meant to sound like a product placement. Um, I'm mostly German, so when I started wearing kilts, I wanted to wear a kilt representing both my love of Scotland and my German heritage. So I looked around, there was a, uh, a German national tartan called Eichelmann Number no. 5. I wasn't a big fan of that. I actually made a kilt for myself in it. Didn't like it that much. I wanted something a little bit more muted. Mm -hmm. So I ended up designing the German Heritage and the German American Tartans. Um, so just for, basically just for myself, but a lot of guys with German Heritage tend to like kilts. I don't know why, but we do. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the ones we actually weave in polyviscous fabric as well as wool. Yeah. Um, and there are national tartans for several different nations. Not all of them are readily available, um, but you know I don't think I don't know if there's a French one. Um, I think so. But German, absolutely. What was the other countries he mentioned? Um, the other country he mentioned was Italian. Italian. Um, I designed a tartan called the Italian American Tartan, <laughs> specifically for a customer. He told me effectively what he wanted and wanted me to register it because he wanted to kind of be hands off. So he dictated how it should be done and how it should be designed. Um, but we registered that for him. Now, again, that is a custom weave, mm -hmm. not one that's stock supported. But right. yeah, there's there are plenty of tartans that you can wear that just you know express your love of Scotland and love of kilts that don't aren't necessarily clan tartans. And I think we talked about Celtic Nations tartan last time on the uh, when we were doing the Q and A, and that has all of the colors of the Celtic Nations flags in one tartan, which Rocky also designed. So that's a great universal way to go. More colors in the tartan means more colors you can mix and match with everything else that you're wearing. So that's always good to have uh, have a couple more options. Absolutely. Yeah. Mr. Mack has another question. Yeah, this, this goes in what you guys are talking about now. Mm -hmm. uh, if someone's looking for a tartan, they're not sure what their family tartan is, uh, can they go on our site and search by name? Can they sure. search? Can they search <clears throat> that, you know, through, through our site. How do you find your family yeah. tartan effectively? Yeah. Sure. Um, on our website, if you actually go up to the top of the website in the search bar, the main search bar of the website, type in your surname that you're looking for. Me surname meaning last name. So if your name is McDonald or Fogarty or McGinnis or whatever, um, just type that in the top of the, the website and the results will come up. And the top results will be if you are a sept of a clan or a clan, or a tartan actually has that name, mm -hmm. that'll pop up. So if you are, uh, your last name is Reed, R-E-E -E or R-E-I-D, I know that that's a sept of Robertson. Mm -hmm. So if you search, search on the word Reed on our website, the answers will pop up will be Clan Robertson. When you click on it and actually go into each individual tartan, mm -hmm. it's gonna say sept, you know, septs of Robertson. 
and it'll have all the different names listed out, including Reed. Um, in the case of Irish names, if you search for McDowell or McDonald or whatever, um, and it has a, uh, and there's a particular area of Ireland, a particular county that that name is prominent in, the results will come back with that county tartan. It'll also see if it's a, uh, uh, similar to a Scottish tartan like McDonald will show, well, we'll probably show MacDonald, that kind of thing. So we try to take a lot of the guesswork out on our website to try to help it, you know, help you find your tartan as easily as possible. Um, there are other ways to go about searching for tartans. We are not the be all end all, but we try to give you a good starting point for that. Mr. Mac. All right. So let's say we're getting married soon. And it's Congratulations. Going to, yes. Well, Mac. I should say, say you would be the one to... Uh, That's true. That's true. The, I, thought, uh, I thought Mac was asking you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm taking Mac. I'm flattered. I don't know. Kelly, Kelly might fight me. Um, Brittany might fight me. Kelly would give me to you. Are you kidding me? <laughs> um, so it's a casual wedding. Okay. What, what's type, what style of kilt would you recommend for a casual wedding? And shirts or accessories, that type of thing. Sure. Um... <clears throat> if you're getting married and you're looking to wear a kilt, um, what I would say is think beyond just the wedding and think, I'm going to give you multiple things to think about. So let's assume it is a casual backyard style wedding. You can go with really any of our kilts from the casual kilt all the way up to the premier eight yard kilt. You don't and rem remember it's what you accessorize and you put with the kilt that makes up the outfit. So a premier eight yard kilt would go fine in a backyard wedding with a you know a polo shirt or a Highland shirt and a pair of kilt hose. Um, the yes, <laughs> sorry, my brain just stopped right there. <clears throat> so it depends on what you're wearing with it. The um, what was the question again? So it's a casual wedding. Mm -hmm. What type of kilt would you recommend for that wedding? And shirts, accessories. Right, right, right. Okay, um, but. Again, think beyond the wedding itself. Are you going to be wearing this just one time, just for the wedding? Or are you going to be wearing it, you know, every, you know, couple months to go to church in, for date night, to wear to Celtic Festival, that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Don't just think about what the wedding itself, because ultimately it is a pretty major investment, even if it's just a casual kilt for 120 bucks, it's still a good chunk of change. Mm -hmm. So think beyond the wedding itself. Also think to yourself, Am I going to feel the same way years from now that I do now? Um, don't. There are certain things you don't want to economize on just for the sake of the wedding. If you know, remember these pictures are forever. So if you say, "Well, I'll just wear the cheaper sporin," or "I'll just wear," you know, I, I want to cut corners here. Think about you know this picture is going to be hanging over your mantle, passed down to your great grandkids. So you want to make sure that the the image you are portraying on or for your wedding is something that you want, you know, to look at forever effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a gent come into the store, a friend of mine, last Saturday, and he got his kilt, he got his argyle jacket and vest, dress boring, put everything on, and he looked great. And it was it was almost an emotional moment for me, it really was. <laughs> but it was really cool to see him all suited up and uh, looking at his groomsmen, uh, they went with casual kilts with argyle vests, dress shirts. That's going to look really sharp, too. Uh, they're going to have those kilts to wear out to the festivals, out to pub crawls, Highland Games, whatever they're using those for as well. Uh, so it was neat to see all that come together. And even though he's getting all decked out, he has everything, his groomsmen still look great. Uh, if you have groomsmen that aren't really sure what they're going to do or not, give us a call uh, because we can we can make that happen if, if they're not sure if they want to go really, really formal or if they want to go casual. We can land in the middle and stay at that practical point where they're going to be able to use it for things in the future. What I'd also say is um, come if, if you trust us, come to us with a budget. Just say, look, here's a picture of what I want to look like for my wedding. I have about X number of dollars to spend. What can we do? And what we are actually very good at is saying, okay, you are you have 500 bucks to spend and you want to be casual, but not too casual, you know, kind of a nice back, you know, backyard wedding. We'd say, okay, let's do a semi-traditional kilt, kilt hose flashes, argyle jacket and vest, you know, dress shirt, necktie, mm -hmm. um, and maybe a day sporing. Yeah. That'll add up to about 500 bucks. So 
If you come to us with an idea of what you want and what you're comfortable spending, we'll work within your budget to make sure we're maximizing your look and ultimately trying to get you as close to what your ideal is within that budget. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do that all the time. Yep. Um, this question is about jackets um, from Martin. And Martin <coughs> is asking for those folks who are bigger around the middle of the chest, uh, do stock jackets work or is it best to be measured? I would, I would answer that in saying, you always want to take a chest measurement of yourself. You'll see the warning we have on the website. Let's say you're a 44 in a US suit jacket size, a sport coat, you're going to want to go up to a 46 because all the patterns over in the UK are a little bit smaller. So all of us end up going up by that one size to compensate for that. Um, in the case where you're ordering a stock jacket, and we just helped a gen out with this a couple weeks ago, he ordered, uh, it was a 52 reg jacket and vest and he said i'm not really sure um i would like to wear this for my upcoming wedding and it was in a couple weeks so he already had his kilt he just needed to grab the jacket we sent it out to him the fit was pretty good he ended up taking it to a local tailor they did a couple small things and it ended up working great for him so if needed keep that in the back of your mind too uh, you can always take it to a local tailor seamstress so they can see you in the jacket and make those changes for you that's always really helpful to have it in hand take it to somebody who's capable of doing that since we don't have an in-house jacket tailor specifically yet uh, to do that that's something that is going to be a very fast turnaround compared to ordering a totally custom jacket and waiting for that to come in because as great as they are they do take quite a while to come from Scotland from our tailors over there yep as my uh, uh, fellow kilt maker and friends uh, Matt Newsom says I'm a kilt maker not a tailor there's a difference mm -hmm. um, the a, the tailored jackets look as is correct those are all made over in Scotland so we you know we need all the different measurements the chest size the you know the widest part of the belly the half back the sleeve length all that kind of stuff um, and we also ask you for uh, photos of yourself, front, profile, and rear. That way we can show those to the tailor in Glasgow and say, okay, here's what they look like. Here's the measurements they took. And, you know, cross our fingers and hope that it fits you the best it can, mm -hmm. trusting that you've taken the measurements correctly. Mm -hmm. um, what I generally tell people in the store, as Lucas kind of alluded to, is if you are close but the jacket needs a bit of tweaking, mm -hmm. then buy a jacket that's in an off the rack size, take it to a local tailor who you trust because he will have the advantage of your physical presence mm -hmm. standing in front of him. If you order a custom jacket and vest, we are taking your measurements that we believe are correct, your images, sending them halfway across the world to be made and then shipped back and again, crossing our fingers, hoping that everything works out perfectly, mm -hmm. where they don't have access to your form to be able to say, okay, you know, a little nip here, a little tuck here, you know, put a dart right there. It's a little bit more difficult and there's a little bit more guesswork involved yeah. versus having a jacket from a tailor local to you who can tweak it personally just for your personal you know, figure. Mm -hmm. and, and stock jackets, uh, give us a call at the store. We can get them out the door right away. As long as it's hanging up in the warehouse, we can get it to you as quick as possible. Some tailors take a little bit longer to do those alterations than others. So the sooner you have it in your hands, the better. So you can you can get that worked out if you have to, if your timeline's a little tight. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. William is asking, is there an electric set of bagpipes? And the answer is yes, on several accounts. Uh, there's a number of different makers of electric types of bagpipes. Uh, one, uh, really one of the most popular ones, is Fagerstrom. And Fagerstrom makes an electric bagpipe. It's literally just a tube with touch sensors on the outside. And you can play uh, a small pipe sound, a border pipe sound, a highland bagpipe sound. You can tune it different ways. You can record yourself. You can plug headphones into it, which is really neat. So it's a very, <laughs> <That's> cheating. <laughs> it's a really nice way to, to practice. Um, you know, if you're if you don't want to disturb anybody with your practice channel or a full set of Highland bagpipes, which can be very present in Not volume. Not all spouses <laughs> enjoy when their spouse is is learning the bagpipes. The, the blessing, of the, the blessing? sound of the pipes. Yes. Um, so that's a great way to go with. I have uh, one of those, really happy with that. Uh, there's another type of bagpipe called the Dagger Pipe, uh, the electric style pipe. That one I have less experience with. It's a little bit bigger. Uh, that one is uh, one you can check out. There's a, a new electronic uh, pipe chanter uh, combo kind of thing that was just launched. I'm forgetting the name of it off the top of my head, but that is out there on the market now. It is considerably more expensive than some of the other ones based on all the reviews and everything I've seen from it. It looks 
really great. The other style that you see, you may have seen it without even realizing it, there's a company called Red Pipes, and they make full-on, full bag pipes that are electronics. So you just plug in, you've got all of your different volume options to run that through. So you have a lot of these bands who they're they're on stage all the time. So keeping bagpipes in tune and mic'd up properly is really difficult uh, to do that for every single show and make sure that everything is perfect. Some folks still do it, but the red pipe gives that piper the opportunity to just plug and play, which is really something that would have blown the minds of, you know, pipers a hundred years ago. What do, what do you mean? I could just, you know, plug this in and uh, and play it. So that's a that's something that you'll see. Uh, and they have a whole range of options. They have a Scottish set. They have a medieval looking set. They have a whole bunch of different things. So that's really neat to check out. And that's piping technology in a in a whole different way that it's utilized. Is the does the bag stay inflated for those? Is the do the drones are they functional or just they're, they're, pretty looking? They're not. They're just pretty looking. So the chanter has the touch sensors on it, and the bag is full, so it's under your arm, so it looks like you're playing but that sound is constantly coming out electronically and can be manipulated just like any any other electronic so instrument. Is and the you know blow stick and the everything. The blow stick is there as well. Yeah. So when you're when you're keeping your mouth on the blow stick you're not actually putting air in to power it. You're just looking like you're playing and uh, not worrying about tuning it at all. Wow. <laughs> or hyperventilating. <again. laughs> Correct. <laughs> Mr. Mac, Mac has a question. All right, this is kind of going to go to both of you guys. Okay. Uh, white piper hose. Thing in the past still a thing Ooh. are they Ooh. what's what's the story they the white piper hose uh kind of became popular in the 1980s that's when all the pipe bands kind of started doing it um the pipe piper hose he means like the popcorn top hose um and then after the pipe band started doing it so went the civilian market to a degree um and then the cream hose kind of came into fashion with the uh rental industry and the, mm -hmm. the higher industry in the uk um the do pipe bands still do it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'd say it's less popular now than it was in the 80s, 90s, probably. Mm -hmm. But it's still done. Yeah. Um, I just saw a picture of a band the other day with white piper hose, the first one I'd seen in a while. And when you look at those, obviously they're going to pick up dirt. So you could go to a Highland Games yeah. or a competition, and maybe it rained the previous day, and you're getting mud all over them. That's not so good. That means the band is going to have to replace those, or the individual players are going to have to buy them and replace them. So they're still utilized, but I think darker colors are typically optimal just from that stain <laughs> uh, difference there. It's not going to show up as much on a pair of you know black or charcoal kilt hose just from that as a as a money saving kind of uh, kind of thought there and frankly colored hose generally look in my opinion better or look a little classier than the white hose they're very very stark it's a very uh bold you know bright yeah. color on the lower half of you generally when you're looking at you know color theory for an outfit mm -hmm. darker colors on the bottom lighter colors on top yeah um so, you're so balanced yeah. yeah so it's a little right. bit you know tonal i don't know balanced but yeah. if you have a, yeah, yeah. a tweed jacket mm -hmm. on with the same color hose that's in the tweed jacket, that would be balanced. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's it's done less now than it was done, um, and I'd say good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, would the same thing be said for the spats as well? Is that kind of a, or is that kind of a different ball game there? Spats are effectively a different ball game because it's yeah. more of a military look yeah. than it is a civilian band. Yeah. Um, so if spats are still used, you know, pretty regularly mm -hmm. um, by many of the uh, the pipe bands that we service. Um, generally, that's the same type of band that will have a doublet or have a, uh, a military-style shirt on, mm -hmm. have a horsehair spore and that kind of thing. Uh, those are the types of bands that would go with a military look, therefore they would have spats on generally, versus more of a civilian look for a pipe band right. and have like a an argyle uh, vest, an argyle vest yeah. or a jacket and vest, yeah. pair of ghillie brogues, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Did you have another question? No. Okay. Um, all right, Brad, this is a question for Rocky. He's asking, is there any significant to weathered or muted tartans or is it just a look slash style type of thing? <clears throat> the Think of it as the color palette of the tartan. A tartan is defined by the thread count, meaning, you know, 26 bottle green, 6 white, ba 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 ba. When you add the thread count and the sequence up, warp and weft, you get a tartan. Mm -hmm. Now, the definition of green 
will change depending on if it's the ancient color palette, the weathered color palette, the muted, or the modern color palette. It's just a palette of colors. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, modern color palette, Lucas has on a modern McDonald of the Isles tartan. Mm -hmm. So, the, in a modern color palette, the green is gonna be a bottle green, like a beer bottle green color. The blue is gonna be navy blue. Mm -hmm. The red is gonna be a scarlet red kind of color. Yeah. Yellow is gonna be a bold yellow. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Those are modern colors in a kilt. For ancient, it would be light grass green, um, a light sky blue, a, or, the red would kind of become like an orangish kind of color. Mm -hmm. So it just basically lightens the color palette. Yeah. Muted, um, you have the green is more of an olive green, the uh, blue is going to be like a stormy sky blue, and the red is going to be more of a blood red. Weathered colors, weathered tartans, um, are almost an entirely different color palette, almost so the tartan itself is distinctly recognizable or different as recognizable tartan from the modern or ancient ones. Mm -hmm. The in a ancient, or excuse me, in a weathered color palette, which is actually what I'm wearing, the Scott Green weathered, mm -hmm. the blue becomes like a grayish blue kind of color, like a steel blue. The green becomes a brown color, and the red becomes kind of a salmony red, not pink, but like a salmony kind of red color. Yeah. So the color palettes change across depending on whether it's ancient, modern, weathered, muted, you know, color palette. Mm -hmm. And when folks are getting their first kilt. I would say a lot of them tend to look at the modern tartans first because they see the white, the navy blue, the green. Um, that That's what I see frequently. I won't say all the time, but they look at that and they say, oh, those colors are going to be easy to match. Um, sometimes if they see a muted or weathered tartan, it just captures their heart and they love that. They love seeing their tartan done in that, in that color palette. They'll go for that. Um, but a lot of folks do look at the modern tartans first and maybe down the road get a muted or a weathered tartan um, on, on occasion. Yeah. So. The, uh, the thing that I find amusing um, is guys will come into the store and you lay out all the different tartans and I would say two thirds to three quarters of the guys will say, oh, I want the dark one. And yes. you say, why do you want the dark one? Mm -hmm. And they say, well, because I don't want to stand out, to which I will reply, dude, you're wearing a kilt. <laughs> you're going to stand out. Whether it's bright or not, you're going to stand out. Yep. And then most of the guys go, oh, yeah, you're right. Okay. And that kind of disarms them. Then they start looking at which colors they actually like better when they're less worried about standing out for some reason. Yeah, absolutely. All righty. Um, Steven is asking us a jacket question. He's saying that the Argyle jacket looks um, from images that he's seen online to fit a little bit looser in the waist area than a traditional suit jacket sports coat um, it looks a little bit boxier is that usual um i would kind of disagree they're they're tailored about the same amount depends on the well it depends what you're comparing it to i'd guess um if you're first thing that, that i'm going to point out actually on a kilt jacket, you do not button the front of the jacket. There are buttons there, it is. it will function, but you generally leave the jacket open. Now for Saxon wear, um, you'll notice when guys are standing up, they button their jacket and they stand there with their tie coming down, then they button their jacket. When they go to sit down, they'll unbutton it, then they'll sit down. Yeah. For Highland wear jackets, you don't button the jacket and vest, or, mm -hmm. or you button the vest, but yep. not the jacket itself. Yep. So that may contribute a little bit to it looking a little bit boxier. Mm -hmm. Um, if you, uh, but generally they're not cut, you know, body shape wise, all that different than, you know, regular Saxon wear suit jackets. Mm -hmm. The one thing I'll say about Argyle vests, when we have folks come into the store to try on Argyle vests, a lot of them say, oh, you know, I have, I have a little bit of room up front here. It's, it, it, it's kind of loose. And we'll, we'll typically say and point out, hey, the, the kilt, especially if you're wearing a wool kilt, is going to add a little bit of room there. The dress shirt will add a little bit. The tie will add a little bit, too. So for those vests, you want to have a tiny bit of room in the front to be comfortable. There's a lot of contemporary vests that are out there that are very tight and very and very slim fitting. So with an argyle, you wanna have a little bit of room for those other things up front. And there's a cinch in the back of the vest as well. So you can open it up uh, to give yourself a little more, close it back to, to bring it in a little bit. That's something that we have a frequent question on out in the stores. We're trying on the, the argyle jackets especially. I'd also say this in, in response to that, mm -hmm. it is probably likely 
that a lot of those guys don't wear vests. True. So a lot of our customers, you know, most Americans don't wear a vest as part of their normal ensemble, as mm-hmm. it were. Um, so they would... <laughs> I had to do that. I don't know why. Um, most Americans don't wear vests as part of their normal outfit. So when they try on a vest, they don't know necessarily how it's supposed to sit. Now, when you actually sit down wearing a vest, your butt, and especially with a kilt, a kilt kind of acts as, you know, it, it, it holds you in. It's very fir- firm fitting mm-hmm. and it's worn much higher than a pair of pants. So when you sit down, your, you know, your organs and your, your fat inside your body have to go somewhere. So since the kilt is actually physically restricting you body, your, your body from moving, it actually goes up a little bit. And when you sit, it actually pulls at the buttons a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's not a lot of slack here right now on mm-hmm. Lucas's vest, mm-hmm. but when he stands up, it actually, you know, there is a little bit of slack there. Yep. So it's kind of, it has to be comfortable standing and sitting. So it has to have enough room to sit, but not too much room when you're standing. It's kind of a weird in the middle. Yeah, yeah. sitting down, we'll, we'll do that test in the store. We'll say, okay, how does this vest feel? Go grab a seat in one of our comfy leather chairs out there in the showroom and see see how it uh, see how it feels. So that's Absolutely. always a good a good way to go. Yep. Yeah. Um, Jeffrey is asking us, um, he says, I'm a large man and I have a hard time finding kilt socks that will fit over my calves without getting stretched out. Any ideas? The first thing to look at would be the Lewis hose that we have because they come in size XL. So those are very comfortable and that's a great way to go. We've definitely helped some folks out there. A gent who was in on Saturday, I uh, was a Highland Games participant and was getting all of his gear for a couple formal occasions that are coming up, the Lewis hose worked out really well for him. So that's always nice to have as an option. The cotton hose that we got are also pretty useful for those um, those guys that need the, the bigger kilt hose. Now, th- specifically in the cotton hose, I've had a couple p- people say the oatmeal, the tan color in the cotton hose, is even a little extra stretchier compared to some of the other ones. Because so, they're ribbed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are those are a little bit different in the in the patterning. So that's a great a great option. Did he to have say as what well. size shoe he is? Uh, he did not, unfortunately. Then I'd be very careful about the saying extra large for the Lewis. Yeah. Um, the extra large is basically just the, sh- the foot size. Yeah. So it's not going to give any mm-hmm. extra width in the calf. Mm-hmm. It's only going to be the length of the foot. So right. he's going to end up if he's, yeah. So I'd be careful about yeah. that part. Yeah. Um, that being said, yeah, the Lewis hose are going to stretch a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, the cotton hose definitely stretch a good bit more. Mm-hmm. We also have hand knit kilt hose, yes. which they come in wide sizes since they are physically hand knit by little old ladies in Scotland. Highly trained. Um, Highly trained. Yes. Yeah. Um, they actually, we just tell them, hey, we want the calf to be wider on these pairs. And then they just, you know, increase the stitches as they go up. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also with the uh, the same company that makes our, uh, the Lewis Hose, the, ha- the company's called House Achieve It. Um, that same company offers what they call Harris Hose. That's one of their styles. Mm-hmm. We don't carry them as stock, but we can get them in a few weeks um, if needed, those actually stretch up to 21 or 22 inch calves. Yeah. So those are a good option for you as well. Generally, generally speaking, I would I'd say this as a blanket statement: mm-hmm. if you have larger calves, you're gonna pay more money for your kilt hose to be comfortable, but mm-hmm. it can be done. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely worth it for the for the comfort factor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Nigel. Nigel is asking around the belly button or the hips. What is the proper way to wear the kilt? The traditional way, I'll, pr- I'll phrase it that way, mm-hmm. to wear a kilt is up above your belly button. The, the, if you think of yourself, you know, think of your skeleton. Your belly button is actually in line on the side of your body with the widest part of your hips. So that is where your true waist is. When you put on a kilt, the top buckles on the right and left side of the kilt are going to cinch in right at that spot on your body. Mm -hmm. And then since your hips won't give, Mm -hmm. it won't fall down. Um, That is where a kilt is traditionally worn. If you're going to wear a casual kilt in casual kind of setting, you can wear it like you wear a pair of pants. The thing that I would point out where it kind of falls short a little bit is when I say a kilt is a versatile garment and you can wear it dressed up or dressed down, if you're wearing your kilt casually, and you know, down like where you wear your pants, fine. Mm-hmm. But if you try to pair it with a Prince Charlie jacket and vest, a Prince Charlie jacket and vest is cut much higher mm-hmm. under the assumption that you're wearing a proper kilt. Mm-hmm. So on the side of your body, you're gonna have 
two inches of white shirt showing where the the bottom of the vest does not meet the top of your kilt. That is why you wear, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna wear your kilt formally and dressed up, or even not not even formally, just dressed up a bit, um, then I'd say I'd lean towards getting it worn at the higher true waist versus the, the lower jeans waist. Yeah, in in speaking to that. Um... My fiance was over in Scotland a couple weeks ago, and she actually brought me back some Scottish wedding magazines to look through, which is pretty exciting. And on the front cover of one of them is a gent in a kilt, and he's wearing it very low, and he's got the white shirt poking out from the side. And I saw that. It's like, oh, no, what are you doing? So no big deal. He still looked great. But when we can prevent that, we should, we should do that. <laughs> yeah. It looks, bottom line is it kind of looks sloppy, and yeah. especially for... A formal function yeah. or a formal event where there's going to be a ton of pictures mm -hmm. you don't want to look sloppy you want to look your best and we're going to try to think of those things for you it's kind of our job to navigate we're not you know driving you you are driving the vehicle and we are the navigator pointing out the potholes in the road showing you where the pitfalls may or may not be and then if you decide you want to do something for a specific reason that's fine you can hit that pothole you can do that we just it's our job to make sure that you know that it's either either a faux pas or something that's not typically done so we can use your voice as a gps as people are driving like, <laughs> no turn around go to usa kills <laughs> i don't think people would hire me for a gps there'd be far too many explicatives <laughs> <laughs> Not good for family road trips, no, I guess. No. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Mac, you have a question. All right. So, skin dues mm. and dirks. Mm -hmm. Should they be worn together? Should they be worn separate? Should they how 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 should I wear them? Um, a skin do for those who don't know is the eh, 6 or 8 inch dagger that you stick in the sock on your dominant hand. So, if you're right-handed, you stick it in the sock on your right leg. Um, it is effectively a decorative knife. Um, it can be worn. Uh, there are formal ones, there are casual ones, or day wear skin dues. Um, you do not have to wear it when you're wearing a kilt, but you can if you want to. The dirk is uh, a 18 inch or so long knife. It has little, uh, what's called a frog, the little loop, and you actually hang it from the belt that you're wearing. You do not have to wear them together. You can absolutely wear them separately. Um, I would say skin dues are much more common than dirks. Dirks are like a physical weapon that, you know, you would, you know, well, they're both weapons, but one's much more practical. A skin do you can have in your sock. It's more of like a utility knife kind of thing today mm -hmm. or a pocket knife today mm -hmm. versus a sword, which would be much more like a gun today. Yeah. So you don't often need a full gun when you're going out, but a lot of guys do carry pocket knives. Mm -hmm. And that's a kind of a parallel to draw. That's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And, you, and you wore a dirk for your wedding, that fancy one that's up on the shelf over there. I didn't wear it. Oh, you didn't? Okay. No, I had it. That was what we used to cut our cake. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So we just used it. it to cut the cake. I didn't wear it. Um, I didn't wear a belt because I had it on a dress for and Right on. And a dirk is kind of awkward yeah. to wear yeah, with the kilt sometimes. Yeah. 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 And I was also wearing an argyle. So the jacket, the body of an argyle jacket um, is a little bit longer than the body of a PC. Yeah. So it's easier to wear a dirk with a PC where the body of the jacket is actually cut higher yeah. than it is with an argyle. Yeah, cool. Good call. Thank you. Um, question from Rod. Rod is a fellow Piper and Sea Chanty enthusiast. Uh, he is asking, what's your preferred method and approach to practicing pipes on your own? In other words, what do you recommend in terms of amount of time spent in practice and what to focus on in that practice? Uh, that's a heavy question. could be answered a lot of different ways, so I will summarize as best I can. Um, when it comes to practicing, uh, do it every single day. <laughs> that's something that I, I actually had a student who, who came over last night for a lesson, and he said, Lucas, I, I did something different this week. I practiced every single day since my last lesson. And he was a lot more excited when he came in uh, to play. We, he had worked on a whole bunch of tunes, and we gave him, and I gave him new material, new stuff to work on. So I always say five minutes a day is better than nothing. Everybody's busy all the time, has stuff going on. If you can practice five minutes a day here, 10 minutes a day, 15 minutes a, a, day, a, a day there, off and on, it's much better than doing nothing at all because you're, you're putting everything back into your muscle memory, you're picking up the chanter, hopefully with straight, <coughs> relaxed fingers, you're 
playing through your tunes, your scales. Um, plenty of guys that I know, uh, they, they get really busy during the course of the week and then they try to cram in a bunch of practice in one slot. That doesn't always work. It's good to play for a while to increase your stamina, uh, but sometimes, you know, you can't, you can't jam, it's like studying before a big exam. You can't, you can't jam everything in there and expect to remember it uh, and then pull it out when you're playing um, later on in the week. So I would say, you know, any time during the day where you feel comfortable, a lot of guys will, will play like in the morning before they go to work. I will play my practice chanter sometimes in the morning before I come into work just to make sure the fingers are, are, uh, are moving, playing well, and then later on in the week, um, maybe do some heavier practice in the evening. So it's good to kind of shuffle that practice time around if you're somebody like me. Um, some folks are gonna be a lot more comfortable in the routine of, hey, I'm gonna sit down for a half hour every single day after dinner and play. Uh, that's really good to do too. So it's part of it is knowing yourself and yeah. knowing what's gonna, what's gonna work for you. And I will say it every single time we talk about practice, um, immersing yourself as much as possible is so critical. It's just like learning anything new. Uh, you really need to take all the resources that you possibly can, listening to pipe music, watching folks on YouTube playing. Uh, the other thing that's really important and will give you results very quickly is recording yourself. You can turn on the audio recorder app on your phone, listen to how you're playing. You may hear some things that are not so good. <laughs> Delete them immediately. <laughs> you may hear some things that are good. You may surprise yourself. So that's a really unique resource, kind of like Audacity and GarageBand. Like if musicians had those types of resources, you know, 50, 60 years ago, oh my goodness, wow, we can make so much progress so much faster. Recording yourself, um, taking a video of yourself playing so you can watch your, your fingers, playing in front of a mirror, all of these things are really good things to do. So don't be afraid to use a little bit of technology because as Rocky said, you could just delete it right away if you're not happy with it, make a better one and keep moving forward. So the, the other thing I would say is you want to prevent yourself from plateauing. And by plateauing, I mean, you, you know, you work hard, you get up to the point where you're playing all these really tunes and then you just, you just kind of stop and, and you level out. It's good to make a lot of progress, but you want to keep moving upward. Even if you're just moving upward just a little bit, you know, working on a tune that's a little bit harder, uh, making yourself sight read through a tune. Uh, a lot of pipers have the Scots Guards books, which are chock full of tunes of all different types, marches, straths bays, reels, hornpipes, jigs. Just open up one of those. Give yourself some practice time to do something totally new and totally off the wall just to keep your, your interest involved in it. Hey, I've never played this tune before, but you know what? I'm going to look up a recording of it, listen to it, then I'm going to read the music. That's something I, I do pretty frequently just to just to get some new tunes in the fingers. Um, you can do that and it makes it a lot of fun you're doing something totally new. You're not just playing the same bank of you know band tunes over and over again. So that's my input. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> One other thing I'd add as well is um, Lucas talked about knowing yourself. For me, the way I would have to do it if I were to play bagpipes and you don't want me to, um, if I were to play bagpipes, it would have to be a regimented thing, mm -hmm. and I'd have to stick to a schedule. Um, another thing is if you take lessons with somebody, yeah. or you have a somebody else who's learning and you're going to practice with them, mm -hmm. being, uh, being beholden to someone else is going to commit you more mm -hmm. than doing it yourself. Mm -hmm. If I say I'm going to go every night and play hockey at a specific time, mm -hmm. if I try to stick to that time, you know, I may be able to do that, mm -hmm. doing it every single night at a specific time and setting that for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And after two weeks, a habit starts to become yeah. something you just do yeah. naturally. Yeah. That's one thing. The other thing is if you do do it with somebody else, even if you don't want to do it, like lifting weights, even if you yeah. don't want to do it in the morning, if, some, if you're meeting somebody somewhere to do it or they're coming over to your house, you don't want to let them down. Mm -hmm. You don't want to disappoint them. Mm -hmm. So you're going to stick to it more than if you're just doing it for yourself because mm -hmm. you're going to let yourself off the hook much easier than somebody else would. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say as you were starting to, to mention that was it's, it's just like having a gym buddy. So if you're starting to learn the pipes, if you've got a family member, if you've got a friend who's interested or maybe you're learning snare drum, tenor drum to, to, to be involved with a pipe band, it's a lot more fun to, to do it with, uh, with a buddy and to progress at the same time. So... <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if he progresses if and you're not, you're he, gonna be really angry. If you're a competitive person, <laughs> that will spur you on to keep to keep playing. So yeah, knowing yourself and that's definitely definitely part of it. Very good. Mr. Mac. Uh, you're talking about channers. Uh -huh. So do channers come with different mouthpieces, like as far as the openings of some round, some that's oval. That's a good question. And are uh -huh. we able to get 
those sure. different versions. Sure. So for practice chanters, for the the greater majority of them, they're all going to be a circular mouthpiece. Now, when you get on to the actual um, uh, blow sticks on a Highland pipe, uh, those will have different shapes as well. They'll be circular. There's a lot of them that are an oval shape, uh, which I, I tend to prefer. That makes it a little bit easier. So on practice chanters, for the most part, they are all circular. Um, but when you get on to the Highland pipe, since you're putting a different volume of air through, um, that's something that you do have a bit more of, a, of an option for. Okay. Yeah. Let's do one more question. We're at about the hour and a half mark, so we're going to do one oh, more wow. question and see what happens here. Time flies. Um, last question here, uh, kilt question. How many yards do you need to make a kilt? Depends on the size of the guy and the style of kilt. Mm -hmm. um, if you are a skinnier guy and you're doing a four yard box plate kilt, you need two yards double width or a four yard single width to be able to make the kilt. Or for instance, one of our casual kilts uses about four to four and a half yards or so. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at a, an eight yard wool kilt, it uses, oddly enough, eight yards of cloth. Um, single width, eight yards of cloth. Double width, four yards of cloth. What I mean by double width is the mill, when they weave the fabric, um, the bolt of fabric is actually between 54 and 60 inches wide generally. So that is what's considered double width. Mm -hmm. So when you order an eight yard kilt in Black Watch, yes, we'll order four yards of cloth and then basically cut it down the center and turn it and splice it so that there's gonna be a seam mm -hmm. hidden in the depth of one of the back plates, you know, effectively right near the middle. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it, that way it's, we're not having to, you know, you know, use too much cloth or extra cloth or throw it out or whatever. Um, so four yards double width is enough for an eight yard kilt. Mm -hmm. Or in the case of sp uh, specific mills like House of Edgar, we have single width. We would just order eight yards single width of cloth. That's great. Very good. Yeah, thank you guys for all your questions. We had a, we had a lot of nice questions today, some really cool bagpipe questions for me to answer, so thank you for that. Uh, yeah, this is Absolutely. probably one of our longer Q&As, hour and a half. We did about an hour and a half last time. So Yeah, yeah keep the questions coming. Keep asking us what's, uh, what's on your mind with kilts, with pipes, all that. We love to help you best we can. Yeah, and as I said before, um, our tartan designer is now effectively live on the website. Mm -hmm. Go to usakilts.com oh, yeah. forward slash tartan designer. Poke around there, design some stuff, save it, edit it, do whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. Let me know what you think about it. Let us know, you know, if you have any feedback on the actual tartan designer or whether you just, you know, want to play around with it. Yeah. I did put it in the comments section, so as the cool. guys are scrolling through, they can click on the link there. Nice. Very good. Nice. Cool. All right, boys and girls. Well, until next time, we'll see you in about a month. Uh, we'll be up, we do this the first Friday of every single month, mm -hmm. 3 o'clock, the first Friday, Eastern Standard Time. So until we see you next time, Slanjava.